How's it going, everyone? As you guys know, I joined Bitcoin Magazine in the end of April. It's an exciting job to be at, but I want you guys to be at the Bitcoin conference. So make sure to get your tickets by going to b.tc forward slash conference. That's b.tc forward slash conference. Use the promo code YTMAG, as in YouTube Magazine, for 21% off. The best promo code in the business. Since I joined Bitcoin Magazine, I love working for a Bitcoin-only company. It's great to work with other like-minded Bitcoiners. Uh, make sure to that I can see you there with other great Bitcoiners such as Preston Pish, Stephen Levera, even President of El Salvador, Bukele, will be there for Bitcoin 2022. That is go to b.tc forward slash conference uh, and use code YTMAG at checkout for 21% off your conference tickets. Hope to see you guys there. Have a good one. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Salamo, and I am an amateur investor. This podcast is my open source journal of everything I learn about investing and wealth management. I'm here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path towards financial independence and financial literacy. My mission is to build us from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are my own, and I recommend that you should do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. I hope you enjoy all right how's it going everyone welcome to the show this is episode 70 of the amateur investors i have the pleasure of speaking with my coworker chris smith chris is a senior at lipscone university studying finance and also a coworker of mine interning at bitcoin magazine chris thanks for coming on the show yeah of course chris i'm happy to be on it uh really looking forward to this yeah, so I guess uh, before we get into all the good Bitcoin stuff, uh, like I just want to hear a little bit, little bit about yourself. Uh, how did you grow up? What was your home life like? What was your family like? Sure. Yeah. So um, I had a dad who was a teacher and a mom who was a real estate agent. Um, so um, the 08 crisis really, I guess, hit our family hard. That was kind of one of the, the key milestones in my life because um, she was in real estate. Um, and my dad was a teacher. He really did what he enjoyed. He was also a baseball coach, but, um, you know, you don't really make much money being a teacher. So um, that was something that was really, really prevalent um, for my family growing up. But um, it was a good household. It was it was a Christian household, which is um, a bit humorous to say how I guess my own transition has gone through um, my own beliefs and um, just kind of becoming my own person, my own man, you know, um, but it was good. It was good, uh, a good household and a good support beam, I guess, from my parents to my brother. Um, my brother's a senior songwriter. Um, his name's Ernest. He's a country music, I guess. I want to say a star, but he tries his best. <laughs> He's more of a songwriter, but he actually just released um, an album two days ago on Friday, um, since we're recording this on Saturday, I guess it was yesterday, but uh, he released an album. He signed a Big Loud Records in Nashville. Um, so he's come a long way as well, but he's one of my best friends and um, me and him have always stuck together um, through everything. So we we don't talk as much as we probably should we're both really really busy in our own careers but we definitely hang out and try and support each other in every way that we can so yeah that's that's a little bit about my home life yeah that's awesome that's awesome chris uh, i guess now we're getting more transitioning into bitcoin so how did you first hear about bitcoin and then what made you get into it eventually or, or when did you get into it yeah so i heard about Back in high school, I heard about Bitcoin and Tron, <laughs> which was really funny. I had a friend in high school who was like super invested in the Tron and ended up losing all of his money. <laughs> this was like back in 2017. So um, for me, I'm 22. So in 2017, that was like either my sophomore or junior year of high school. Um, so I knew about Bitcoin. I had no idea what it actually was. I just knew that it was some type of online 
payment or market system where people made money, people lost money. I knew I was kind of into online gambling as a high schooler, <laughs> um, getting on VPNs. And I really specifically was kind of gambling on CSGO betting sites. <laughs> so I don't know if you know anything about that, but um, there used no, to be definitely. Like, if, if you want to expand on that, for sure. I know what CSGO yeah. is. Ca Counter-Strike Go, for those that are wondering, it's a video yeah. game, a first-person shooter for the listeners. Yeah, Counter-Strike yeah. Global, Counter Global Offensive. And uh, back in the day, there they were like, I'm sure they still do it, but just esports games between different teams on CSGO. And there's a big gambling scene. I don't know if it was that big. I thought it was big. Um, where you could just go bet on which team would like either win each round or which team um, would win the game entirely. Or you could also do like some more sketchy stuff and like um, gamble like skins within the game. Um, and all the sites that I use like did a lot of stuff with Bitcoin. So I knew about Bitcoin and I had actually used Bitcoin for gambling before I ever even knew what proof of work was <laughs> so that was kind of my journey into it but um more or less i went into college and didn't really think much about it um it, it just wasn't a topic of mine that i really thought about a lot um until in 2019 one of my really good friends zach martin his dad um, was a cybersecurity ceo of i think it was the largest cybersecurity company in west virginia at the time and his like his whole um, coder team was like, you have to get into Bitcoin. Like, um, like you got to put a lot of money into it. So I always heard them talking about it because I was at their house all the time. And he's the one who ended up orange pilling me. And he's actually really good friends with Robert Breedlove. Um, so he got orange pilled by Breedlove and I got orange pilled by him. So I like to say that I secondhand got orange filled by Robert Breedlove. <laughs> so th this is your friend's dad, you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His name's Jeff Martin. He is, he's such a good guy. Um, yeah, Nashville based. He, he played baseball at Vanderbilt University. Um, but yeah, he, he's a good guy. And he got me into Bitcoin in 2019. Well, he was telling me all about it, right? Um, and I like had a little bit of money in it on Coinbase or some type of centralized exchange. Um, I, I didn't understand it fully, but each time I went over there, we would like talk about like geopolitical stuff and just where the world is, where the world's going. Um, he was a really macro economic type of thinker, which um, I believe is like what really drove why he was so successful. So he was more or less like a mentor of mine that I really looked up to. So when he would talk about Bitcoin, I would really, this was like the first time I would really listen to him about it or to anybody about it, because I really respected like how he got to where he was and um, just kind of a mentor, I guess, a role model of mine. So we would talk a lot about it in 2019. I didn't have much skin in the game. I was more or less just learning about it. And then in 2020, when COVID hit, um, I guess being at home and really being in the position that I was, I was still going over their house a lot. And my eyes really started to open up to what it actually was. And I think COVID was an eye opener for a lot of people, uh, but especially me, and my generation, COVID was kind of like the spark of the fire that that really lit a lot of people's brains and a lot of people's eyes up to what Bitcoin really is. And that's kind of where I started. And after COVID hit and after I really started getting into it, listening to the What is Money series by Robert Breedlove with Michael Saylor, that was one of my foundational works on getting into Bitcoin and understanding the theology behind it. Um, Man, I, I haven't looked back since. I ended up dedicating basically my whole entire career to it, um, being a finance major. And I guess we'll talk about it in a little bit from just learning about it from sitting at home on COVID to orange pulling my whole entire fraternity. Um, that's kind of like my journey. And I look to continue to just keep learning more and teaching others. That's awesome. So I, I guess I'm glad you brought that up. I wanted to ask about you going into 
uh, finance. So that, that's obviously your major right now. But um, so, so I guess you were a sophomore when COVID finally hit or was, yeah, is that was right? Sophomore. So, so you're a sophomore, you're learning uh, Keynesian economics or the general yeah. economics that like 99% of people learn. They kind of throw the Austrian school out the window. And then there's a couple different like brackets of Keynesian economics, like different factions, the MMT group or, you know, uh, modern monetary theory. So going into that, so, so now you're kind of seeing Bitcoin and what it is, I guess, what are your thoughts on, on your major? Not, I don't want to say education's a waste, but what, what are your thoughts on the major that you have in finance now? Is it kind of like a joke or what, what are your thoughts on it right now? Yeah, I don't know if I would ever go to say that education's a waste. I would definitely say that education is not needed. Um, but my parents instilled in me at a super young age that any tool you can add to your belt is a tool that is good. Um, and more or less, whether or not I think that 90% of what I learn is utter BS is a different story, but a degree is a degree. And there's a lot of people in my family who never had the opportunity to go to college. And um, that's why when I started interning at Bitcoin Magazine, everyone was like, drop out, drop out. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, I, I want to. Yeah, I really want to, but um, I'm going to finish it out because um, like I said, there's a lot of people in my family who never got the opportunity to. Um, and it, it is another tool in my belt. But as far as the actual curriculum that is taught, I mean, give me a break. <laughs> it, um, it's pretty ridiculous about, I guess, the monopolistic pressure on the curriculum that's being taught specifically in the business world. Um, specifically the finance, accounting, and marketing majors, I would say. Uh, there's really only two companies that produce curriculum at all within the whole entire United States at a, as a whole, and that's McGraw-Hill. And, uh, and every single student in the whole entire country studies curriculum produced by McGraw-Hill. And McGraw-Hill McGraw is a huge conglomerate of educational books ranging from pre-K all the way through when you finish out high school. Um, and I can't recall exactly off the top of my head what the, what the second company is, um, but basically it's all centered around like this one type of way to, uh, to teach you things. And I believe that most of education is to confuse you. Uh, really like when you learn, they don't teach you any really big picture things. They kind of confuse you into where they make you feel dumb and stupid until you end up understanding kind of their way that they came to think about it instead of giving you a macro topic and letting you have your own independent thought of coming to that conclusion yourself, um, which I think is ultimately the core concept of what misguided education is. It's shoving the way that you came to a certain conclusion down another person's throat instead of letting them come to their own conclusion themselves, um, which is what I love about Bitcoin. Bitcoin is, we'll, we'll help you a little bit, but you, uh, you have to come to this conclusion yourself. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about finance and what I don't personally love about it. Um, but nonetheless, it is a tool and um, I'm very, very grateful of being able to go to a school and get an education, whereas most of the people in the world couldn't, would love to be in the position that I'm in. Yeah. And the, the, the other company, so it's McGraw Hill and Cengage. Uh, oh, I think Cengage. it's the, yeah, yeah. Cengage. Yeah. They are only, uh, I guess the only other company that might be bigger than them is Pearson's, which is a British company, Pearson. but um, the US market is largely owned by 80% 80, 80 is by McGraw and Cengage. This article is from 2019 that I'm looking into right now, and they were actually trying to merge the two companies. They're <laughs> claiming that it'll make uh, the merger will make textbooks more affordable, but anyone who has a basic understanding of economics, if they become a monopoly in the US market alone, basically, 
um, the consolidation and power will just lead to higher prices of the books because they can charge you whatever you want because you can only get books from them. Um, and yeah, like to your point, uh, they brought in in 2018, 3.16 billion in revenue and they have over 44 thousand titles in a variety of fields and subjects uh, and fields and subjects. Yeah. Wow. So pretty crazy. Uh, yeah, exactly yeah. to your point. So uh, I guess before we get into uh, the article that you wrote for Bitcoin magazine, I guess uh, I know I'm a little bit older than you. I graduated college in 2015. So I was just curious to see, you know, uh, all right, let, let me, let me, let me rewind. I, I'm very similar to you. Like 2020, my eyes were really open to like what's going on in the world, the COVID crisis, how we recovered. I mean, Michael Saylor was kind of a big part of my journey. And I know a lot of Bitcoiners in my class uh, were the same class as Michael Sa Saylor and a lot of the great content that he's produced in, you know, a little uh, under two years now um, is just really eye opening and shows like why he's the trendsetter for you know, basically doing Bitcoin as a treasury reserve asset. And we'll get into your fraternity in a minute. But I guess just even me looking, I graduated in 2015, like I said. And I guess uh, my question to you is, well, like, what are your worldviews or views on the state of the world right now? I say this not to be like, um, to put pressure on you to say like, oh, what are your views? What do you, what do you, to be a predictor or an oracle? But I just say this because, because even from when I graduated in 2015 to 2022, the world's in a very different place. And, and Speaking from just someone who's lived from 2015 in the working world to now, uh, I can't say with full certainty it's a better place to live. Uh, yeah, maybe te our technology has gotten better. And I think Jeff Booth brings that up in The Price of Tomorrow about deflationary forces such as technology that they get cheaper, but they get faster, more data and all that. But in terms of like monetary and, and socially what's going on in the world, it seems people are working harder and harder and they're just getting like caught in the rat race or stuck in the wheel or, you know, there's many different... Uh, you know, sayings for this. So I guess, well, what are your thoughts on, on the, the current state of the world? And I guess uh, I'll pitch, I'll softball this, but how do you think we fix that? Yeah, um, huh, that's, a, that's a loaded question for sure. Let me, let me start, I guess, by saying that I saw a tweet the other day and it was kind of about the Ukrainian crisis, um, which is a major, major geopolitical event that's currently occurring obviously best best Bitcoin, Bitcoin use case that I've seen in a while. But anyway, um, further on, I would say that there's, regarding that crisis, I forgot who it was. Huh. It, anyway, he said, I don't know what's going on because everybody was like asking him, I guess he was he's very involved in geopolitics and specifically like war politics, I guess. Um, and he was like, I don't know what's going on. And then he like commented back at his tweet and he was like, you don't know what's going on either. <laughs> and I think that that was a really like, I really related to what he said a lot because there's so much misinformation on honestly both sides. Um, and it's so prevalent to me that yes there's misinformation on one side but for as much mis misinformation that there's on one side there's also that much on the other if not more um and really ultimately i guess the latest trends in the world have kind of drove me to pursue what i call the pursuit of truth um, and that's taking everything at an arm's length and not just trusting what somebody says. And I love the phrase with Bitcoin that's like, don't trust, verify. And that is not just transactional based. There's a reason that that is, I believe, such a common way of thinking with Bitcoiners because it's not just transactional. It's in almost every aspect of life. Don't don't trust verify. I saw that DuckDuckGo the other day um, kind of took a fall. Uh, we can touch on this a little bit if you want, because I think this really interests me that DuckDuckGo really fought for privacy of users and um, combating the, I guess, social constraints that Google and so many other search engines had put as just using their customers as their product, really. Um, 
the product of Google is you and I and everybody else who uses Google. Like that is where they make money. They make money off of their users. Um, and DuckDuckGo more or less was kind of the, the outlier to that. And we've seen that recently DuckDuckGo, is, <laughs> the ship has fallen. And uh, somebody else said this. I thought this was really good. It was anything that can be corrupted will be corrupted eventually. Um, and even something like DuckDuckGo, something that their backbone of what they fought for and the reason they created their whole company was to never fall into what they have now fallen into. But what their flaw was, they made a system that could be corrupted eventually. And then we see that through years and years and years of pressure on whatever the variables might be, eventually, yes, something that could be corrupted, will be corrupted. Um, and I think that kind of thesis can play really strongly in what has gone on in the world in the last couple of years. There's lots of aspects that weren't necessarily corrupted until recently, but the reason that they were corrupted was because they were made in a system that could be. Uh, and I think that is... I can touch on little things about COVID and mask and mandates and so many things that I more or less agree or disagree with. Um, but I don't think that much of that matters as much as the, the things that we should take away from this because we can't change what is in the past, but we can learn the lessons that created the issue in the first place. And I think the biggest lesson of COVID of all was stuff that, like I said, stuff that can be corrupted will end up eventually being corrupted. Chris, I think that's, you know, really great with what you're saying. And I completely agree. And this is something I heard recently. I don't know if it was on uh, BTC Sessions, because I know uh, you are recently on his uh, <laughs> podcast on Friday night last night. Um, but someone said uh, the protocol that that is Bitcoin is so perfectly aligned. It's a perfect alignment of incentives. And, and if I'm miscrediting him or someone else, um, I just heard and it really stuck out with, with me. And um, like these companies like Getter or Rumble or or the or DuckDuckGo, for example, they they always start with we promise we will never censor you. And I know Justin Rizvani, uh, he's coming, he, he works on get, uh, or Zion is the name of the, the company. Basically it's a peer to peer, uh, node to node. It, it's a social media company built on base layer uh, or on the second layer of Bitcoin that is lightning. And basically the way that it works is I'm gonna put this in layman's terms. I start running a node, I spin up a node and you spin up a node. We connect to each other's nodes and it's peer to peer communication. So the way that it works is files are encrypted by sending a three sat file or, or three sats from me to you and then back to me. So even though a payment of three sats went to you, you unencrypt the information and then three sats gets spent back, is sent back to me, no transaction occurred. Since the Lightning Network, you can send payments basically free uh, and instantaneously, you, you and I can encrypt information. You have a node, which is like your own personal server is a way to think of it, or like a modem is to the internet. And like, I have a node, which is like my own personal way. And there's no middleman that's grabbing it in between, whether you're going to a browser or whatever. Anyway, uh, the way that I'm laying this out is Justin says, we, when we say we can't censor you, we can't, it's not like we won't, it's, we literally can't. Uh, mm -hmm. And he needs to say that is because exactly to your point, like DuckDuckGo says, we're here for liberty, we're here for freedom, we're here for privacy, security. They like list this whole laundry list of things that sound great, but when incentives ultimately come around, they're forced either to accept the money from governments or whatever, to because not that they're co-opted, but advertisers or governments that want to advertise on them, it's either you take the money, but when you take the money, it comes like the money comes with uh, a caveat or like, a, like a, a, it hinges on something else. You've got to do this or else you don't get the money. So to exactly to your point, like DuckDuckGo is saying like, oh, now we're censoring or, or we're changing the way that information lays. It's like all these companies, they say like, oh, like Rumble saying, oh, like if, if Spotify censors Joe Rogan, which they kind of already have begun, like we'll, we'll pay him this is salary and we'll never do it. It's like, you can say that until the money dries up. And the only way you can get money is from the person that's trying to co-opt you or trying to enforce your incentives. And it's, it's always 
you know, like I understand these companies, they're trying to build something to combat it. But the only way that this can truly be done is through Bitcoin. Like we've seen like, okay, Facebook's rise and slightly fall or Google or Apple or any of these companies, they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. Like the US government is one of their largest customers in the sense that they buy a lot of services from them, whether it's phones, whether it's servers, whether it's you know, uh, they give them ad money for, for pushing out ads on Ukraine or the vaccines or whatever it may be, um, not to hinge good or bad one way or the other, but it's like the incentives don't align or the in incentives align with what's going to happen. Like they will eventually be co-opted because if they don't take the money, one of their competitors will, and their competitors will outcompete them because they're getting money. And exactly like the Contillon effect, the, those that are closest to the money printer benefit the most. Uh, I, I don't know if you want to expand on anything that I said there. I know I rambled for a minute. No, no, that's, no, it's exactly, and that's just one small micro example of time and time and time again, where this isn't a new idea at all, right? This is an idea that has been around for longer than me and you have, for sure. No, this is an idea that is ingrained in human nature. Um, humans will corrupt what they can corrupt eventually because of what human nature is. So if you need to base anything off of something, it needs to be something that is incorruptible, um, which I, I haven't heard too much. I'm definitely going to go and research a bit more about that peer-to-peer um, -peer, um, social network that you're talking about. Yeah, it's uh, Justin Rizvani, and also the chief marketing officer is J.P. Sears, the comedian. J.P. Sears, um, okay. Yep, yep. So yep. Justin Rizvani partnered uh, or brought uh, J.P. on a, as uh, a partner for that project. Um, it's okay. still in the opening stages. They're still very much in beta. It's fully open source. Um, but yeah, no, it's a really project that I'm looking forward to. I know that they will both be at Bitcoin 2022. Um, it's yeah. really exciting to see. I think you go get, get Zion.com. Um, and you can get on the waiting list to see what it is. I, I know last night I was watching a bunch of videos and, and I put myself on the waiting list and I'm excited to test around and tinker and play with it for sure. Zion. And that's a historically humorous name as well for what exactly they're accomplishing. So yeah, I love that. I love that. I, I really love what JP is doing as well. Um, I think he's super based. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it, but, um, I, I'd love to see, I guess, what the benefits of a social network like that is where you are no longer a tool of profitability, right? Like you yourself, the user of the social network is not a ad to a company that is encrypted in a social algorithm that a group of computers have created through AI software that is not even controlled by a singular human with a brain. Um, yeah. Have you watched the social network? Uh, or the, uh, I've seen the social network, but do you also mean the social dilemma or are you talking about? Social dilemma. Yes, both of them. I've seen both of them, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. See, social network was the Winklevoss one. No, the social dilemma. Yeah. Um, I never knew I never knew the actual where the algorithm came from and that it didn't actually come from a specific human mind train. It was generated through automation, um, which I think is so interesting. Um, and it actually kind of makes sense. You know, a lot of the issues that we see that come through social media, it makes sense that no human had control over that. And why would you give that control over to something that didn't understand the human to begin with? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a, a great point. Um, yeah, and I think, so a lot of people were even asking them, so get, get Zion. So we always talk about, you know, if it's free, you are the customer. Uh, I will say Zion isn't free. Well, they have two ways that they make money. One is if you don't have your own node, so if you're not running your own Bitcoin node and connect it to the server in order to use this service, uh, you can buy cloud node space, which basically means that you're going to pay a monthly fee to basically get a company like Voltage.Cloud to basically spin up a virtual cloud server for you. And that has SaaS or Bitcoin in it that you can transact to do things. 
The other way is as you put Bitcoin or SACs into their service, there's a small, small, small fee. I think it's like less than 1% that if you want to withdraw, uh, that they take a small percentage of that total amount. So if you had, you know, let's just say 100 SACs, you're trying to withdraw to your own wallet, cold storage, or take off your, your node, it'll be, you know, they take one SAT of the 99 that you get out of that 100. Um, and the thing that they were saying that's really cool about this, it creates a creator user experience that's very beneficial. So if I'm a content creator or you're a content creator and we're making something, a video, whatever, and we're pushing it out to the people that follow us, and then they really like it, they can like, like, but instead of like a like being just like the heart that you see on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, you can also put it that you send them five sats, like, oh, I love this video that you did. Here's five sats to you. And then in that, like, let's just say I make a piece of content, you really like it, you like it, but then you also want to reward me. So you give me five stats. If you then say a great comment, like, Chris, this is so funny. If, you know, you were doing this and instead you do X, Y, and Z instead, like, that'll be even better. I can send stats back. So it, like, if people are in your comments and like, you want to reward your fans for supporting you, you could like them back instantaneously without pressure of a banking system, whether it's Venmo, Cash App, or not saying that those are not good services, but we see that there's limitations to them. If you don't have the same political affiliation, if you did or said something that they don't like, they can turn off your account. If you know, you're know you at a country that's non-OFAC compliant or part on the, um, the cut off from the SWIFT system, like the Russians, for whatever reason, you can't transact with them where this is a, is a network that can't be stopped. I can send you sats, you can send me sats and no one can stop us. No intermediary in between can shut us off or stop us. So yes, it does cost money if you don't have your own node. So building your own node would cost money or if you wanna pay for the cloud service, but, or, uh, and you also get a small fee when you go to the withdraw to take self custody of it yourself. But I think the, the service that this provides is, is excellent for, for what it is. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to getting off the wait list and, and testing it out. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, add anything else before I move on to the next topic. Yeah, just this is kind of Silk Road 101. Um, little plug, free Ross. But <laughs> uh, no, just nothing can stop it. And that was the threat and why ultimately Ross isn't with us in Miami this year, honestly, because like he created something that they couldn't control. And unfortunately, they couldn't take it out on Bitcoin. So they decided to take it out on him. And he was the one who fell for that. And free Ross, that's all I gotta say. Yeah. And the thing that's a shame too, is he's never had a trial. Uh, I mean, I think he has double, uh, double 40 year life sentences. I mean, barring basically a pardon. I mean, they're still trying to go through the appeal process, but they're trying to make an example of him. He, he was a contribute, a main contributor, but I don't, he wasn't the only contributor. So it's weird that no. they're just, and, and not saying that the other contributors should be go after them. I don't believe that either. It's just crazy. I mean, I hope a Bitcoiner becomes president and they can use their presidential powers to pardon him. Uh, yeah. You know, it'll be years too late already, but um, you know, that's, that's the only hope that I really hope to have or, or see happen one day that he doesn't die in prison. And um, yeah, it's a real shame. I know his mom just tweeted out that um, it's the first time in a couple months she's getting to see her son. Uh, I don't know if it was this weekend or next week, but um, yeah, I definitely agree. Free Ross. Yeah. Um, so moving on to the next topic now, Chris, I guess before we get into your fraternity, once again, I, I swear we will get into that topic in a little bit. How is Bitcoin perceived among college kids outside of your fraternity? Because your article touches on your fraternity specifically, but outside, like you can talk about your general friends and then even about the broader people at the college. Is it, do they know about it? Do they not know about it? Do they like it? Do they hate it? Do they not care? I, I guess what's the sentiment of, of college students or at least at your university? Yeah, so let me start a little bit further back, just about my generation. And this is something that I believe I understand at this point enough to talk about it. There's still parts of it that I haven't fully comprehended yet, but I think I've processed this enough to at least be able to talk about this. Um, my generation does, I believe is the first generation to really have a sense of disrespect and not desire to pursue the generations above us. Maybe not 
you're like maybe not the millennial generation, but I'm more talking about like the boomers and Gen X than them. And I really believe that this is a byproduct of technology because we got consumed in a world that was only existent between really our generation and the millennial generation. So the only people who we really had a respect for was also people who consumed themselves in that world and people who related on that front. And I don't, I, it's not our fault. I don't think it's our fault, but I think um, there's no really point in discussing something like this and saying, oh, it was their fault. It was, I don't, it was nobody's fault. Nobody knew that this was going to happen, but it was a byproduct of what did happen. And I do think that there is a disconnect between my generation and older generations more so than any type of generational disconnect in the history of mankind due to social media, technology, um, and the ability to adapt to it and how quickly you can adapt to it. Um, because, I mean, I I had an iPhone in eighth grade. Think about that for a second. <laughs> in eighth grade, like I'm in middle school, little eighth grade Chris was walking around with an iPhone and had complete touch with everybody else my age around the whole entire world. And I was 14 years old, um, which now, like, I think about the generations, like, that are younger than me, like, I at least got to experience a lot of life, like, without this technological pressure, this social media pressure. I didn't really have social media accounts until I was at least a little bit older. Now, these kids have like iPhones when they're like in kindergarten, like they're yeah. playing on iPads, like in the car and they're like tiny. And like, I never had that, but um, I do think it's created like this generational um, kind of disrespect, I guess. So to, to, I guess your question and to my point of this being, um, when my generation hears about something that goes against what the older generations cherish and thrive on, there's a bit more acceptance to that uh, because of that basis of what I was discussing earlier of that they don't really need to understand what it is, but if it is against what is against, what it is against, um, like they're for it you know like you'll never be better friends with someone who has a co a common enemy as you you know so like if my generation more or less thinks that it's pretty anti-establishment in general anti-system just because of that basis and i don't think the social media or tech a lot technology companies knew that this was going to happen. I think this was something that completely got out of control, like completely out of their hands. And I don't know if they've ever really sat down and realized exactly what they did. Um, but what, what it plays into Bitcoin is Bitcoin is more or less a protest. Um, and it's a protest. It's a different protest for every different individual. Um, each person can use Bitcoin for their own protest, but at the end of the day, I do think that it is a protest and our generation, my generation is more akin to being on the side of the protest that is against what they have been against for a while and what they are accustomed to being against. So there is this acceptance of like we like this for the most part, like most, most of what I hear, I actually hear this all the time, like with my peers, I bet I've heard this over a hundred times just being in college. I think Bitcoin is the future, but I have no idea what it is. <laughs> They've already concluded that it is the future. They're like, yeah, I admit it's the future, but I don't know what it is. I don't know how it works. I don't know what it does. But, but they're cool with it. it, it it's interesting. But um, 
that's the most common question answer and question I get. Like if they see me like rocking a Bitcoin magazine shirt or something, they'll be like, oh, like like any type of small talk about Bitcoin, they're like, I definitely think that like it's here to stay, but I just don't know what it is. <laughs> so yeah, that's like a little bit of backstory on why my thesis is what it is. But I think it's true. I think that my generation will probably be the first to adopt it, not because of the fundamentals of Bitcoin, but because they want to be against what they've always been against. And I don't know if that's a good thing, but I think that is the reality of it. And I think that's something that I've concluded for sure. Yeah, Chris, that's very interesting. So uh, I was, like I said, I'm a little bit older than you. So what I was around when Facebook was kind of becoming a thing. And obviously, you know, Facebook launched in uh, 2004, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, and it was for only Harvard students. That's how it started off. Then it kind of slowly spread to other colleges. They wanted other Ivy Leagues on this network. Then it spread to the MITs and Stanfords as well. Then uh, it spread to um, kind of colleges in general. By like 2006, seven timeframe, I was in sixth or seventh grade. Um, it was spreading to more high schools. But then a lot of the college kids were getting mad seeing high schoolers get on the platform to the point where I remember, I vividly remember this, like there was kids that were saying they were getting bullied in my grade of like high schoolers or even middle schoolers, because that's how old I was going on the platform. And these college kids are like, get the fuck off the platform. Like, this isn't for you. Like, I'm serious. And that was like an issue back in the day. Obviously, you know, now everyone and their grandmother's on it. But um, it was definitely a thing that like they wanted the exclusivity. And, and I kind of feel like Bitcoin's at that like kind of point to your point of saying like everyone kind of sees it like 2007. Everyone was seeing what Bitcoin or what Facebook was, but didn't know what it, it was going to become. Like they didn't think it was going to be the Facebook or meta that it is now. Um, so I, th I think that's pretty crazy, but it's, it's very much like being primed, at least for your generation. Uh, it remains to be seen whether the, and even with my generation, but the baby boomers and, and Gen X, we'll see if they really go into it. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it's very important and, and that's very cool. So now tying it back into your article. So Chris, you wrote an article that said about, and I, uh, forgive me on the title, but I know it was basically talking about how your Bitcoin, uh, your fraternity adopted Bitcoin as your treasury reserve asset. Can you please mm -hmm. tell me the story of uh, how that ended up happening, why that ended up happening, and then ultimately the outcome of it? Yeah, just one more thing on the what we were talking about on Bitcoin being a little exclusive. I think that this is something that through the last two years has gotten better, but Bitcoin still has, it's going through growing pains, but it still has major strides on accepting new individuals where they are. Um, there's a lot of, this is something that I've noticed. Um, I guess older Bitcoiners need, really need to improve on, and that's understanding that people haven't been studying it for five, six, seven years like you have and can't just quickly comprehend these new aspects of Bitcoin as they come along because they don't have the fundamental basis that you do, right? Um, yeah, you're trying to like, condense like five years of learning into like a 30 second or 90 yeah, second pitch. Yeah, and I think there needs to be just a little bit more... I was going to say sympathy. I think empathy is the right word there of like, I understand like I was in your shoes at one point, curious, so curious, willing to learn, but just needed direction instead of um, trying to talk over their head and never talking in layman terms and never trying to come down to that level, always trying to bring somebody up to where their level is. Um, because I think there would be a lot more education just peer to peer if each individual Bitcoiner would be able to, okay, let me go down to their level real quick. Let me, and I think Sailor is like the perfect person for this. Like you see him, he'll go talk high level with anybody at the highest level, or he'll go on T Tucker Carlson and 
basically orange pill the whole entire audience with example after example like trying to come to their level he's always like giving analogies like if you're a nurse if you're a student if you're a teacher if you're blah 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 this this and that he can always find a way for you to understand it and um i think there's there's strides but i think we're getting better Definitely. And, and I guess I, I want to caveat this one thing I said. So Facebook had an exclusivity aspect. Bitcoin doesn't. But I, it's just I was talking about how the, the early stages of adoption of where we are in terms of Bitcoin relative to, to Facebook back then. They didn't know what it was going to become. Uh, but yeah, no, definitely uh, to your point. Um, we are still very early and there's still a lot to learn. There's still a lot of people that need to come on board. I forget the numbers. I think it's like only one percent of the global population that that's on it. And uh, you know, you hope that that gr number grows, uh, and as it grows, you know, it, in turn, the price goes up as well. Um, so I guess getting back to your fraternity. So why ultimately, why did you guys, why did you guys have a need for adopting Bitcoin as your treasury reserve aspect or uh, asset? And then uh, what, what's the story behind it and what's been the outcome? Yeah. So my friend, Sean and I, he was the president of the fraternity, um, both of us were execs, so we are, we have kind of like a board of five executives that really make all the decisions for the fraternity, and we're elected on by our peers, and um, him and I have, he, he was friends with Zach as well, so him and I were uh, kind of orange-pilled at the same time, I guess. He got orange-pilled quicker than me. During the COVID drop, he actually sold his car, and scooped up like multiple bitcoins and like yeah crazy he, he's stuff. very happy right now <laughs> very happy he'll never sell it it like it's just sitting in cold storage he he he's super orange filled but um he, he's a guy he's a year younger than me but he's gonna do some really good things for bitcoin he's so he's out there but he's also no, he's out there, but in a, in a really good way of like, he's thinking about stuff that nobody else is thinking about, right? Um, but yeah, he he kind of was like the pressure on me because we were learning it at the exact same time, but he, he got it faster than me. I kind of went through that wave where you're like, oh, crypto, not just Bitcoin, crypto, like, oh, we like crypto, all the cryptos, we love trading cryptos and making money, <laughs> you know, oh, these things are going up a thousand percent, like, I need my hand in on this, um, just kind of the greed aspect of everything, um, the early stages of really trying to understand what, what is right in front of you, um, but he he got it really quickly. He he definitely got it before me, and he was the pressure on me to really dive into it. Um, but I guess that was 2019. So fast forward to 2021, him and I had really been studying this for about two years, a year and a half, two years, and we were both executives, and we were getting ready for the school year, and we had a lot of alumni donations coming in to prepare for the school year. Um, because alumni loves being involved on every college campus, you know, um, they get tax write-offs and <laughs> the, their club that they, they are still involved in, that they still have passion for, um, gets a benefit as well. And like alumni are always the most generous. I don't know, out of almost all organizations, alumni just love donating to their to their organization because they want that organization. They want the legacy that they put so much work in to continue, right? Um, and for that, just to keep going and keep going. And they want, anyway, we, <laughs> I won't get it too much into all that, but basically we were having alumni donations come in and they were coming in through wire bank transfers into our school bank account that was completely custodied by the school's financial system. And each time donations came in and we wanted to withdraw it, there was a percentage fee that the school was re, uh, retaining for themselves in order to be the, the custodian of those assets, to be kind of the middleman. 
so more or less what I'm saying is the school tried to act like a bank um, in their own little way. Trying to charge you for the money that you're receiving and they don't, they don't want to give the fee to the school. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. They don't. And um, I understand that like, if there was a fee that they had to pay. Okay. But I, that wasn't the case here. Um, and it's not like fraternities around the nations are getting like a hundred dollar donations, by the way, fraternities around the nations are, around like the United States specifically, like they're getting a lot of money. <laughs> um, like there, there are a lot of donations, especially like big nationally record recognized fraternities like SAE and like ATO um, and just really, really huge, large organizations. They're getting hundreds of thousands of dollars a year um, getting donated to them. And after I guess this happened to us. I started talking to a lot of my other friends at other schools, and I realized that, oh, no student organization around the United States actually custodies their own assets whatsoever. Um, that's just not a thing. The school has custody of all of this money, and they're earning this small percentage fee to just be the transactor. Um, so, of course, Sean and I at the time were super down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. And we were like, obviously this is what we need to do. And we were scared because not a lot of people in the club at that time understood it at all, number one, or were even a fan of it. Um, they kind of turned a blind eye. So we didn't want like pushback. Uh, it's always fearful to be a leader of a group of people that like look up to you and then like if they think you're investing in a Ponzi you don't want them thinking that they're just we're just putting all their money into something that like we're just like going out on a limb and gambling on but I, they we they ended up passing it like basically a hundred percent to do it because I think they they knew that at least through our passion and what we we came before this, our club and kind of explained why we were doing it. And I guess they saw or trusted us, or I don't know why they did it. Maybe it was stupid of them to trust us to do it, but they did. Um, and nonetheless, right when we got permission, we didn't want to do this without everybody's knowledge. Um, but once everybody was on board, we really went to town and followed Sailor Sue. And I like to call it the Sailor Strat where we take a small or where we take like the percentage of our treasury assets so we have to be liquid as a club because we are constantly paying for events and constantly sending money here there here there and unfortunately the the current system that we operate in at least within the realm of academia does not allow the asset that we're liquid with to be bitcoin um, so we have to have U.S. dollars to pay for um, an event venue that we have our formal at or to pay for a brotherhood retreat where we go ski in Colorado. You know, there's a lot of like we just can't do that with Bitcoin yet. So we have to be liquid, but we have a treasury of money that we set aside that if it wasn't in Bitcoin, it's sitting in U.S. dollars in a bank account that is just locked. L losing purchasing power at negative yields and all the money printing that's yes. going on. So that's yeah. awesome. I mean, yeah, I guess you guys can't be as, um, uh, how will I say this? You can't be like Sailor where he's constantly buying and has basically converted over his whole treasury and then any incoming revenues. I'm sure that he keeps some US dollars on hand for yeah. exactly the same reasons, but uh, we would all love to be Michael Sailor and have the magnitude of Bitcoin that he currently has for sure. Um Chris, I, I mean, thank you for that story. That's a really cool story. So I, I guess I have two quick questions on that and then uh, we'll, we'll go begin the wrap up here. So uh, that's awesome that you guys implement this. So my first question would be, 
did you guys like open source this or obviously aside from the article that you wrote for Bitcoin magazine, but have you like published like a GitHub page or something basically saying this is how we did it. This is what wallet we use. We're running our own node, something like that. And then my second thing is, have you had outreach from other uh, brotherhood fraternities that are the same, uh, I guess, Greek letters as you or the, or the same fraternity, but just other universities or cross university uh, fraternities or sororities reach out to you about doing this? Yeah. Um, first, we haven't published a GitHub. That's actually a really good idea. I know that there's probably members because we have a lot of computer science majors as well in our club. So I'm sure like that would be a great thing for them to put on their resume. So I'll definitely. And, yeah, yeah. And you don't even have to put like the code. You could just say we use Moon Wallet. We run it yeah. to our own node. You know, yeah. we, we we keep a portion in a treasury reserve and like just kind of outline the steps. We applied being doing X, Y and Z. It doesn't even have to be coding. It could just literally be like a Word document just written in sure. GitHub. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but we originally were covered uh, by our school news network. It's called Illumination. Um, and they did an article on us, like just in house, because we like approached them and we were like, hey, you have got to cover this. This is going to be sick. <laughs> and they were like, okay, we'll cover it. And um, our president ended up doing like a one on one interview with their head publisher and just telling her all the steps. And then I also, um, I guess, wrote the article. And I don't, yeah, I don't think I could touch on this too much, but there is some exciting news, I guess, in the future that could come out where we get to talk about this on kind of more of a public stage per se. So um, more to come on that. I wish I could talk about it, but I really can't. Not all the details are like finalized about it yet. Yep, um, no worries. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm excited but, for whatever's in the pipeline. No, it's going to be cool. It's going to be cool. But yeah, no fraternities have really reached out to us. Um, I don't think it's really been in their sight of even really knowing that it happened. But like I just said, um, what's kind of in the making right now, hopefully when more student organizations get wind that not only did we do this, but after doing this for a year, two years, look at how successful it's been for us of tracking transactions and like all the benefits of just paying dues in Bitcoin that we've actually been able to increase our actual operating power and efficiency through doing this. Um, I think they'll be able to see that we are the case study for this. And so far it's working great. I would definitely love to see this get picked up by like a bar stool sports or something like that. Yeah. Kind of like, you know, they kind of have that college audience for sure. Even if, yeah. uh, you know, more news comes about it, about the bigger platform, you kind of tweet it, uh, you know, Portnoy, call them paper hands Portnoy, but we're diamond hands fraternity or something along those lines would be uh, hilarious. Um, Chris, thanks so much for your story and coming on. It's been a pleasure having you on. Before I let you go, I always ask two questions and then the third one allow you to tell people where they can find you online. Um, so uh, before I let you go, I guess, what's been your biggest investing or business mistake? I know you're young, but I know uh, maybe if you have an idea about mistakes that you've made with just investing or putting your money in uh, certain areas. Yeah, mistake. Huh, that's a good question. I would say... <sighs> I bought Tesla right after their IPO and I sold it for a baseball glove. Damn. <laughs> yeah. And that was like, I don't know if you know about baseball like equipment, but it was like a $300 glove. And like, that would be worth like upwards of like eight, $9,000 today. Like that's, that's wild. Like, yeah, definitely that for sure. All right. That's a good one. Uh, I guess what are your favorite books, podcasts, YouTube channels, or websites that you like to go to for, or, uh, for Bitcoin advice? Um, yeah. Like I said earlier, I love, I really love everything that Breedlove does. I love his what is money series with Michael Saylor. Um, I, I really love Safe Dean's work, um, both um, the Bitcoin standard and the fiat standard. Um, and not, not to plug our company too hard, but I love Bitcoin Magazine. And also what my favorite thing about Bitcoin 
Bitcoin Magazine is honestly the Carrot app. I love the Carrot app, just earning free sats. And it's um, they're doing so many updates now, like daily with the Carrot team. Um, I know they're in the office all the time now. Like they're really working their ass off on this thing. But it's going to be really cool what, what they end up like developing it to be but it's already such a great tool of like having all these different authors just in one place where you can just see all of their work um and one more thing alex gladstein's compilation of all of his writings um that he's done in bitcoin magazine i forgot exactly what he named it yeah i think he it's a uh, check it. your financial privilege is the name check of it. your financial privilege yes that got released a couple of days ago um i've just been going through that and he has some awesome work as well so yeah yeah i mean we we work with so many great not even just bitcoiners just great people um you know i'm uh in shock and awe of just the the number of sheer talented people in the organization i, I consider it like a privilege that i call them I get to be lucky enough to be one of their coworkers. You included, Chris. Yeah. Uh, you do a lot of work, even though I know you're just an intern. Uh, everyone pulls their weight at the company, and, and I seriously mean that. Everyone does. I'm working hard. Really looking forward to the Bitcoin conference, April 6th through the 9th. So a little shameless plug there. If you guys haven't gotten your tickets already, go to b.tc forward slash conference. Use the code YTMAG for 10% off your conference tickets. And Chris and I hope to see you guys in Miami Beach then. So Chris, before I let you go, if uh, thank you so much for your time. But uh, where would someone go to find out more about you? Yeah, um, really just go to my Twitter at Chris Smith 256 um, a little Shaw 256 that's where I got it from. It's really hard to come up with a, a username with Chris Smith. I'm not going to lie to you. So I just went with 256. So at Chris Smith 256, the link in my bio is also, also my Bitcoin Magazine author page. So you can go read my work. Also, my pinned tweet is my article as well. So if you want to learn more about how uh, we came to having a Bitcoin standard in my fraternity and just a small microcosm of the impact that Bitcoin can have on organizations across the globe. Go read that. And one last thing, go to conference, hear what Naive Bukele has to say. Rumor has it he's announcing something super, super big. So, yeah. Chris, thank you once again for coming on. Thanks, everyone, for listening. I'll catch you guys next week. Have a good one. Peace out.